Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of the Guitar Souls podcast with Mike McLaughlin. How's it going, man? Very good, thank you. How about you, man? Not bad. Am I set? Yeah, Levi Clay. I'm doing good. I am, um, yeah, bad organiser today. Double booking myself, just constantly double booking myself, constantly getting messages on Skype from students like, cool, is it our lesson now? And I'm like, uh... Yes. (laughs) Yes. Yes, it is. I would say that uh, you just have an exceptional work ethic. An exceptional overwork ethic. <laughs> constantly, constantly. Like I was up today at 11 o'clock and I had to be up today at 11 o'clock because I was with a student. When I say up at 11 o'clock, I mean up for 11 o'clock. I was yeah. up working at 11 because uh, I was with a student yesterday who who drives down from Perth. Uh, wow. Yeah, yeah. For a two hour lesson every every two weeks. And uh, like half an hour into my lesson with him, my Skype started ringing for another student. Oh, I'm like, dude, no. I'm, I'm so sorry, but I've double booked again. So... And he's like, tomorrow morning? And I'm like, sure, anytime. He's like, 11 o'clock? And I'm like, uh, sure. <laughs> anytime. Yeah, but uh, good good guys, My the people that I work with, they are very understanding of how much of a flake I can be. It's not even it's that not I'm often. a flake. I don't flake on people. I just poorly <laughs> organize my time. <coughs> it's not like Excuse I cancel me. on people because I can't be asked. No. It's like, I've messed up big time. <laughs> I need no, to be dying right. to cancel a lesson because I can't be bothered to do it. You, you need to be dying to cancel anything. You are the most particular person about people sticking to their word. Yeah. I'm surprised you, you didn't like shit fit when I said there was going to be a wee bit late earlier, <laughs> which is quite good. Anyway. Well, I mean, you were literally driving over and I was like, dude, um, I'm doing a Skype lesson right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, it makes a change. I fu- Yeah, I fucked up. It makes a change. Um, so, yeah, I fucked up elsewhere, though, as well. Let me tell you about this. So, regarding oh. the pod- last podcast, right? Uh, my well, you know the, the situation we had with... Um, you told me. Who was it? Joe Perry? Yes, that yeah. 15 seconds of absolutely undistinguishable background music yeah. that caused the issue. But do you remember that we also had other audio clips in the episode? That you forgot to take out. Yeah, we, so we had Mr. Big audio clips, and when I edited all of the, the... In the audio version, I put both of those audio clips in, didn't bother removing them. But for YouTube, I decided to remove the Mr. Big ones, but I figured the Joe Perry ones would be absolutely fine. They weren't, so I went through YouTube's automated process, which yes. is they will remove the audio for you. Mm-hmm. But that was taking so long that I decided, you know what? Let's not do that. Let's cancel that, and I'll just re-edit the video, re-render the video, and re-upload the video with a special little message for Joe Perry and his people in there to let the people know. Mm-hmm. And in doing that, it was it literally uploaded, and then I was closing down my video editor, and I was like, oh, I left the Mr. Big in. Oh man, I'm gonna get another copyright strike, but that that didn't get struck. So that's good. That's yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it should be fair use, I would think. Yeah. Yeah, certainly anyway. not. The the thing, the argument I always make when it comes to failure, or the question I I get people to ask, and of course I'm not a lawyer, this isn't advice, mm-hmm. but generally speaking, you have to look at the situation and say, does what somebody has used of your piece circumvent your ability to make money from the piece? Is it a an alternative for the piece? Nobody is going to listen to our podcast as a way of hearing that Joe Perry song in place of actually listening to the song. Yes. It was incidental in the background of what he was talking over. And it's the same with the Mr. Big thing. We use tiny little clips of it just so you can hear a bit of a riff. Um, but nobody's going to go, ah, you know what? I'm not actually going to buy that Mr. Big album. I'll um, just listen to the, the Guitar Souls I'll podcast. I'll listen to those little clips on the Guitar Souls podcast. I get the impression you're going to end up going into like fucking music law at some point. It just it just feels right. I have an interest in it, but yeah, yes, law is, is just one of you. It's just a lot of money, isn't it, to study law? So, yeah. I, I met a guy actually who um, I sold my volume pedal to him. Mm-hmm. I met him down at Motherwell College, kind of expecting to, to meet some like stoner teenager mm-hmm. um, to buy this pedal. And uh, standard he was, for Motherwell, exactly. Yeah, but he was very chatty, um, and he was like, "So, what are you doing?" I was like, oh, "You know, music transcribing, bit of this, bit of that. What about yourself?" And he was like, "Well, I've actually just um, I've decided to do music law. I've been in music for a long time." And I was like, "Oh yeah, what, what have you been in?" He was like, "Well." I just got back from LA. Um, I've had publishing contracts since I was like 16. I've been like flown all over the world and you wouldn't believe, like my life is just a story of writing all of these hit songs for people and then having to sign my rights away on them. Yeah. And I'm like, in Motherwell, you're, you're back in Motherwell. To be fair, I think Central Scotland's quite a hub for music, hmm. but it's never been recognised for it because all the bands that have done it, best case in point is the Bayside Rollers, have been fucked over by someone in a legal sense. Yeah. 
need good lawyers. So <laughs> I think maybe that that's one of the reasons this guy has decided to do what he's done. Yeah, man. Yeah. Getting older and is like, I can look back on all of the bad things, that are mad decisions I've made. And, mm-hmm. you know, I'm not only will I not make those again, but I'll try and help and make sure other people don't make the same things. Be the change you want to see in the world. Yes. Beautiful. Yeah, very nice. Um, so Enjoy we have, the volume pedal. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We have um, a lot of things to talk about today. It's actually not true. We don't have a lot of things to talk about whatsoever. But we've got some interesting, very interesting things yeah, to talk if, about. I mean, to be completely honest, we've not even really looked through the news. I took your word for it that you couldn't find anything newsworthy. Didn't um, see much. Yeah. Um, I think we've got enough kind of incidental stories that are, are worth talking about. I think we've it? got one that you're going to rant for quite some time on. Is that the one that's on screen now? Yes. Oh, you'll rant about that just as much as I will. I will. I will. <laughs> you are right. Yeah. So today, we'll do that one first. I'll leave that for last. That. Today, we are going to talk about um, Pledge Music again. They're, yes, uh, we are. One of their their majority shareholder is being done for for fraud and you know penny stock fraud to yeah twenty five million dollars yeah a lot lot of money yeah doesn't seem like a trustworthy guy to be giving money to to dish it out to other yeah. people we need to talk about Jason Becker the we great do. the legend the man is not well um, so I thought it would be a nice opportunity to talk about how much of an influence Jason had been Jason has been on both of us absolutely um, man and to uh, you know if, if people have not. Uh, they're unaware of Jason's story, you know, to check out Jason. because he's. Um... If he's not an influence on you, you are wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, we talk about Devin Townsend because uh, there was a funny story posted on Ultimate Guitar. Not just that, it's also good advertising for his newest album. I've only heard the first track and it sounds like it's going to be fucking outrageous. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. He's just a beast. He really is just a... The thing is, right, that the track, when I first heard it, the first listen, I was like, for anyone that's not heard, it's called Genesis. Go and watch the video. The video is phenomenal. The tune is great. My first listen is like, this is really like eclectic, but it doesn't seem like it's trying to be. Mm-hmm. It flows so well, yeah. but there's so many elements in it. And then you just remember that it's Devin Towns and you're like, all right, cool. So it's like world music as a bald man with anger problems. He um he kind of makes me see some of the validity in reaction videos. Because, you know, we've both talked about reaction videos and how much we dislike them, even though we've done, we reacted to a Symphony X thing. But we're not using that as like a main medium of content. That's literally a, here's something we find yes. X way. Let's see how we actually react to this. Yeah. And while there's all those people reacting to, you know, Tozen Abassi or... Reaction Jeffy coach, or reaction, whatever, reaction coach. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, good old Kieran. Uh, his new Mind video is numbing. funny, of course. I don't know how he just consistently does all of that. Anyway. um, Talented motherfucker. Martin Miller has been suggesting to me for quite a long time that I should do reaction videos uh, as a guitar teacher. So a guitar teacher reacts to guitar videos Mm -hmm. um, because he he's a great singer as we know but he hasn't always been a great singer he got really serious into singing like three years ago vocal coaching has Mm -hmm. multiple vocal um, lessons a week he's really really serious about it good on him Um, Martin's the real deal yeah so the only way to really describe him is the real deal yeah I've got friends who almost every weekend if they're sitting maybe having a drink or whatever it's like right cool queen medley total medley and they're like you need to see this yeah and they can put the uh, Pink Floyd uh, Dark, Dark Side of the Moon video on now and you can be like, I'm in this video. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. Yeah. So um, he his vocal teacher has started to do reasonably well on YouTube because they have started doing uh, reaction videos where they react to singers. And they not only do they get to you know react, but they also get to talk about the, the, the vocal techniques, yeah. um, where they're going right, where they're going wrong, and things to avoid and things that are... You know, it's more a live critique then. Exactly, yeah. And uh, I keep seeing vocal teachers come up on my YouTube suggested feed and they're all reacting to um, that EMG TV video where he's doing what, Kingdom? Kingdom, or yeah. the really high vocals. Yeah. And I've watched him, do, I've watched that performance like a million times because it's great. Um, but I can't help, whenever I see one come up, I'm like, all right, let's, all right, let's just click on this reaction video and skip to the bit where he starts singing and watch their face. Yeah. And when I do that, I know that I've been suckered in in the exact same way that everyone else has been suckered in. And that's why these reaction videos are successful. I still think they're scummy, but they also entertain me sometimes. And I struggle with that. I think it'd be scummy if it was like there was no validity and no professional input on it. It was literally just people going, oh my God. Yes. But here's the thing. I think it's someone who has a studied and learned background and Mm -hmm. has a valid input to it and like you say you can put in critique and criticisms and pointers uh-huh. that that's different i think but you can do all of those things without playing the entire piece okay so your problem is the fair use content of it which 
which fortunately we mentioned mentioned earlier. Yeah, yeah. Okay. it doesn't act as a total um, substitute for the original, but no. it's it's almost it's close enough. I get what you mean. Yeah. If the video, if Devon's original video was pulled off YouTube and you wanted to watch it, you could watch one of these reaction videos yeah. and you would get everything you wanted from it. But the thing that kind of bugs me is the fakeness about it. Like even the vocal coaches that I'm watching, if they were genuine, true reactions, like this is the first time I've ever seen this video. Someone said I should react to it and I've watched it. If you run a channel like that and people are saying, you should react to this, you should react to this, you should react to this. You're not just going to blindly go, cool, let's do that one. Cause there might be like full frontal nudity in the middle of the video and, you know, cool. Uh, react to Ramstein's pussy video, the original. It's that great. is a great video. Yeah, but yeah, they're gonna watch some of it first. Maybe not all of it. So these teachers, then I just refuse to believe it's the first time they've heard Devin sing like that. So it's no coincidence that when he starts singing, they immediately go, <sighs> yeah, and it, the, the screenshot for the video will be. <sighs> I mean, the the problem they've got is that they're all suggesting the wrong video to react to Devin singing. It should definitely be from the live uh, DVD. The Royal Abbot Hall. Exactly. Yeah. I'm doing funeral and bastard. Yeah. That I mean that is genuinely like when he hits the high notes, I'm like Yeah, yeah, he's uh he's a freak. <laughs> he really is, man. Like I've, he has got a ridiculous vocal range. Mind how I said we weren't going to um we weren't going to play any audio. I'm gonna play some audio. Hit the uh, the mute button on there. Okay. Grab some headphones for yourself. Certainly. So I've been listening to a lot of Bumblefoot this week because I'm oh. a big uh, I'm big big Bumblefoot fan. Understandable. Big shout and out to Ron Thal. Do you know what Ron's vocal part is on the song Women Rule the World? No. Okay. Is it going to be something outrageous? Like a mega falsetto? Yeah. I expected that. Because he's a man of many talents who just is so... I don't know. Uh, humble in every sense. Yep. Somehow. <laughs> Right, so for those of you who can't hear so it, haha. Women rule the world. Going for a They'll be able to hear this. 50s, 60s science fiction movie kind of vibe or TV show. Something very retro. Uh, Look at how not fair use this is. Just going to use the entire video. But we, you don't really have a choice when it's one minute and 24 seconds long. <laughs> yeah. And it needs a theremin or a high opera voice. What we're getting at is go and buy Ron's music. He's great. Like, I think of the old Star Trek theme. Oh. Oh, that kind of thing. So, yeah, that's what we're going for. In the mix. I've heard this a lot, uh, many times, but it wasn't until I saw this video that I was like, oh shit, there's a voice there. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's crazy, isn't it? I, I mean... It's not, it. it's not Devon. Like, it's a totally different thing to what He's Devon bringing does. bringing out the big guns with those whistle notes, though. But, it's, yeah, it's very much a case of look at what someone can do with their voice. What a lunatic. Absolutely, yeah. I think it's great how that's, like, a single wee layer in the music. And you, as someone who, probably the same as me when you're listening to things, you're like, every single time you hear something, you're like, I'm, I'm going to work out what that is, whether you mean it or not. Mm. Yeah. And that still went, like, past. That's cool. <laughs> I like that shit. Um, cool, yeah. So we talk about Pledge Music, talk about Devin Townsend. We're going to talk about Richard Benson um, mm -hmm. briefly. The world's most unfamous, famous man, apparently. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the the legend. But we're going to start by talking about the thing that I'm going to get raging about, you're going to get raging about. Yep. Uh, Vic Guitars. Vic Guitars. Yes. The man. The fiasco. The, uh, it was like five years ago, I think. Was it as much as that? I mean, it was like, it actually could have been. Yep. It was the first time I went to Nam if I, if memory serves me right, which was 20... 2013, 24, right. 20, it's, it's a long time ago. Yes. We'll find out in a second. Yes. Um, essentially what people will remember whenever, <coughs> whenever you see Vic's name come up is you, you probably think, oh, bit of a homophobe, right? But yeah, <laughs> but you can, you probably don't remember the, the details of it. Maybe you heard it in Chinese whispers. 
Mm-hmm. Just say a Vic, bit of a homophobe, right? Hates gay people. Um, cool. Fine. For some reason, years and years after all of this happened, when it was old news, he decided to release an official statement on the 19th of February. And not a good one. Not a good one. Nah. So let's read this. Um, official statement from Vic Guitars. For the last few years, there have been a great amount of rumours and speculation after I made some comments on my personal Facebook page about the headless guitars and the LGBTQ community. A joke turned into a whole lot of drama fueled by my ignorant replies to, uh, to some provocative questions and insinuations. It would probably take a whole book to explain all that happened in details, but this is not the time or the place for it. I'm going to interject here. It's not the time to explain yourself during your official statement. Five years later. <laughs> yeah, I will when, give you that. When you are the person who is explaining what happened yeah. and why you're apologising. I love the H's you're putting in there. What and why. What is your problem? Yeah. So he goes on to say, we all make mistakes and then pay the price for them. I made a mistake of posting something without knowing the state of things on the subject in the world and paid a big price for that. Oh, you're the victim, so you're the victim. Yeah, yeah. However... In the end of the day, it's not about the price, but about what you've learned from it, which of course is true. That's fair. Yep. Um, and what I've learned is that the world is bigger than one man's thoughts or beliefs, especially when those beliefs come from the fact of being born and raised in a fairly conservative, conservative and outdated country, and naturally being a product of that system of values. Again, I agree with that. Like, I, I, That's fair. I think... It's not an excuse, it's a factor. Yeah, yeah. The, the way you think about... Uh, gay people or or black people or or whatever will be <laughs> being racist isn't a good thing of course not but being bigoted in any sense is not a good thing but if you lived in the 1800 southern states of america and you were a racist i wouldn't look at that and go you're you full stop or a piece of shit it's you need you you're need a to learn of your environment yeah exactly you're a product of your environment it's the way sh- i see it isn't maybe why i was so harsh on vic sorry interrupt as Scotland has a big problem with sectarianism. Mm-hmm. It's not so bad these days, but it was certainly bad when I grew up. Yep. And it was always Catholics versus Protestants, Rangers versus Celtic, which mm-hmm. is just basic tribalism. It's still pretty bad. I mean, just recently someone got a tattoo that said, and I, I, I just need to say it as it is, Rickson is a Mongo, which is fucking horrendous. It's about Fernando Rickson, who is a, an ex-Rangers player with like motor neuron disease. Right. That shows the level of stupidity and sickness that some people have inside yep. them to hate people for no reason and to mock them when they're literally ill. Yep. That's fucked. And that happened, and that is a widespread thing here. Most of the time it's shrugged off and taken as the joke that it is, but not always. And the way I see it is, I know plenty of people who are a product of that environment, but they should know better because since that, and from other outside influences and factors, they should really know that that's not a good way to think or be or act. Yes. So understand the factor, understand yep. that they're going to be part or, or a, a product of their environment, as I said, but it's not an excuse. Yeah. Well, well, Sorry. The important thing is kind of what Vic said there, all the dogs are in the room, people, for anyone listening. So sorry. Three guests. Yeah. Um, and the wife is home any second now, so they're probably going to start crying when they when they hear that she's in, but I'll let them out at that point. Anyway, Which will be good. Um, yeah, the, the point is you're totally right. Like... But you can't get that. You can't learn that and and grow and become a better person until you make the mistake and someone yeah, points course, it out. Yeah, yeah, I get um, you. yeah. Uh, so, not not without someone who understands that context and can guide you the right way. Yeah, like I, I was lucky enough that I, I come from a kind of multi background family. My mum's Protestant, my dad's Catholic, and it was never taken seriously from either end. Yep. from either part of the family. So I didn't see it as the big deal it was. So I can understand, or I can't understand even as probably a more accurate way to say it living in one background of family where it's basically everyone saying we hate Catholics and another mm-hmm. family saying we hate Protestants and it becoming that. Sorry. The bit, well, uh, on, in our personal stories, like I don't have that at all. Like It's not a thing in England. Mm-hmm. Um, so That's why I'm saying it's quite like a yeah. tribalistic thing. It's so... But the, So what I'm getting at is you're totally right that sectarianism is, is on the decline in Scotland, but based on what I'm observing, and I think mm-hmm. it's because younger people are more educated in terms of, because they've got the internet and we can connect with each, each other. We, the environment we, is getting better. Having said all of that, though, like our group of friends is 90% Catholic. And when I say Catholic, I don't mean practicing Catholic, but I mean from Catholic families. Yeah, potentially. And then either became non-denominational or just non-practicing yes. themselves. Yeah, and although okay. none of them hold any hatred towards people that are non-Catholics, that doesn't mean 
that they don't make jokes at the expense of. True. And that's that like deep rooted cultural thing. Like even Can if I, there's no hate there, like there's still yeah. I tried to acknowledge that by saying that it does happen as jokes. Like it yes. happens in the workplace as well. It's a big thing in Scotland, like outright. Celtic versus Rangers are the two main football teams and they're known as the old firm. And it was that the Catholic team, if you want to put it that way, it was a Catholic priest that started uh, Celtic as a football team. And I believe that Rangers were started by a Protestant uh, priest or somebody for the clergy or it may have just been like then decided it was Protestant. I don't really know fully, but it seems to be that this is some sort of split that doesn't need to be there. And as much as it's seen... Or a bit unseen, actually, kind of underground where it's all jokes these days. You're absolutely right. It is still a thing that's commented and said. And there could well be hints of, like, horrible bitterness and anger underneath that that people don't realise. And it's definitely a cultural thing. Yeah. Definitely, 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 definitely. Yeah. But because I don't understand it in the slightest, if I... I guess I can pick it up and, and jokingly call a mate an orange bastard. Mm-hmm. But I don't understand the the cultural significance of that. Mm-hmm. Just like I can call someone a Fenian, yeah, and I don't fully understand. Yeah, because of the the historical context of that, I don't understand actually how uh, aggressive or or offensive or or marginalising terms mm-hmm. like that that can be. Because I don't fully understand it. And so what I'm getting at in, in regards to Vic is like I understand like where he's from. Having a, an opinion like that is like a it's very common. Yeah, yeah, probably doesn't make it acceptable. No, of course but, not. But things that are, that that's how we evolve as societies and a, and as a species. We we find things that we do that are wrong, and we work on them. Yep. But that's exactly it. The working on them. So is he? Here's the question. Well, not mm. the question. He goes on to say, even though I've never had hard feelings based on race, religion, or sexual orientation. You sure about that? Yeah, I know I've made some insensitive comments that upset many people, and for that, I'm sorry. Truly. It took me a while, while, a while was it? It took me a while to realise that the world has become very sensitive now, uh, and even a couple of fairly harmless on first sight words can make someone's life harder than it has to be. But truly, it's not so difficult to accept that everyone has the right to live their lives in the way they choose, in dignity and happiness. Vic, I'm not even going to pre- attempt to Kaletsky. K- Kaletsky, yeah. I'm not. I'm not going to attempt to pronounce his name. Immediately pronounce his name. Exactly. <laughs> you, you didn't attempt. You just did. Yeah. I, you know what? I think it's a really dangerous statement. I want. I want to buy into it, and I want to think that he's learned something from it. But mm-hmm. there's things in that that I there's there's words and statements in the sentence in that that full statement that don't ring well with me. They don't mm-hmm. sit well. And I think it's more so the fact that he says like the world has became very sensitive. Like, yeah. No. I it, that could be a poor choice of words because there is a lot of I, I, bad yeah. English in this. Hence why I'm saying I think yeah. it might just be me taking out of context and there's certain bits that I, that I don't sit well with. But it's like there's a, an overarching thing about the statement where he's saying like it's not my fault, but I'm sorry anyway. Rather than just going right, yeah. I fucked up. Yeah, he does try and reiterate several times that it was a joke that turned into a lot of drama. And yeah. this whole the the reason I wanted to talk about this is because when I read the comments to in response to this, there were a lot of people that were heavy, heavy in support of Vic. Yes, like heavy, heavy. You shouldn't be persecuted for jokes, which I believe you shouldn't shouldn't be persecuted for jokes. Absolutely. Um, and we're going to look at what Vic actually said. Mm-hmm. And actually, to be fair, what he said was a joke. He was attempting a joke, but it was. Clearly, one hundred percent based on his like his his views. Like you can have a joke where you're poking fun at ne- a negative stereotype of someone. A joke like that only really works if someone that is either telling the joke or someone that is hearing the joke understands that negative connotation. Case in point, what we've just been talking about with sectarianism in Scotland. Yeah, jokes like that go right over my head. They don't mean anything to me because I don't understand it. Like it's, yeah, it's, but, it's like football. I mean, it basically, as football jokes at this point, like people are starting to move away from the Catholic versus Protestant thing, but that's still deeply ingrained in the football scene. Yeah, I don't have any interest in football whatsoever, but I understand the jokes because I grew up around about that weird divide yeah. of people going to different schools and denominations and having weird rivalries because of that. Yeah, like it's it's so stupid, in my opinion. Yeah. I, I, I think that's human nature to be fair because even the small town that I grew up in had two schools and they weren't 
they, it wasn't a sectarian thing. They, we just happened, there happened to be two schools because it was big enough for there to be two schools. Mm-hmm. Um, and there was rivalry between the two schools. Yeah. Because that's that's human nature, us versus them. Well, um, yeah, that again, tribalism. Yeah, yeah, totally. So initially when you read Vic's statement, you could read this and think to yourself, oh, maybe he's really been persecuted for what he said. So what I decided to do was dig up what he actually said <laughs> and remind people of what he actually said and for you to come to the conclusion of your own of is this actually a joke or is this a joke that is being told based on held beliefs? And yep. to me, that's exactly what it is. So let me grab these comments. It's only funny if you're not the victim kind of thing. What's uh I should point out... Um, no, that's a great reply. Yeah, the top comment... Uh, well, at the time, the top comment... Brian uh, B- Borges? Balgus? I don't know. Wrote, the worst part about hating gay people is just the fact that deep down you're actually worried that dicks are delicious. <laughs> well done. Well done, my man. Uh, very good. Cause, yeah, because of course people have been poking fun at Vic for this. Anyway, so this all came about when um, Paul Masvidal of the band Cynic, um, who on that note, just released a tab book for Focus, their, their first album. Really? That's been fully transcribed, and I bought that. Oh. Um, and I've been told by the guy that transcribed it that they're going to be doing the other albums too. So, oh, exactly. yes. Yes. So I'm going to be learning some Trace Thin Air at some point. I was li- listening to that just the other day. Yeah. Oh, man, what an album. That's an incredible album. King of those who know kicks the dick off me every time. I don't like Focus really at all because of the production. Really? It. Yeah, it's a production thing, but I that, bought it out of, purely out of support because I like the more band. A death album than yes. it is Cynic, in, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, whereas when Trace Thin Air came out, it was like the sound had refined and the production had refined and it, mm. yeah, it, it's super prog at that point. Anyway. Super beautiful. So Paul Masvidal came out as gay. Um, when was this? I mean, I can see that it was May 10th, but I can't see the year. But that's I think a, it was 2013. No, it would have been later than that. 15? Maybe, yeah. Anyway, I remember it being a thing where it was like, people knew... It was not a big deal, yes, because it has no relevance to his music. Yeah, of course. But it was nice that he felt he was comfortable enough in this in the yeah. music industry and in the music uh, scene to put that forward. Yeah. So Vic posted on his personal pa- Facebook page. Well, now I know for sure what uh, what is that something that has always been turning me off about headless guitars. Because here's the joke: Paul Masvidal plays a headless guitar. Vic doesn't like headless guitars. And now he knows why he doesn't like headless guitars because gay people like headless guitars. Yeah, I, headless guitars equal you are being gay, and he doesn't like gay people. It's and it's a shame. That, yeah, it's a, a it's a shame that I have to explain that joke. But to be fair, the top comment on the post was, "And what is it?" question mark And then later on, Vic has said, "Some recent news could give you the answer." Winky face. So I think Zach Cowdery, credit to him as well, gave Vic an out there by saying no head. Yeah. Oh, you don't like blowjobs? Ha, ah, joke. Yeah. And he just went, no, some recent news could give you the answer. Yes. So it's, it, it clearly is a joke. He's like telling a joke, but this is what he thinks and feels. And we know this because, as it goes on, I actually remember that at the time, um, Nolly, get good, had a signature model that Vic mm. was making. Oh, I remember that. And it yeah. was, just... was immediately like, get it out. It's ah. not, not happening anymore. Yep. So Per Nielsen responded. Credit to you, Per. Uh, I've got an interview lined up with with Per. Well, I'm lining up an interview. With Beautiful you, man. Per. That's that's confirmed. We always um, get a pat in the back if I get to speak to him. Certainly about this yeah. because you know what? It's nice when people can use their platform to stick up for people yeah. and I'll, just do the right thing. I'll try and do a doubler. I'll try and get him on for uh, for the guitar souls as well as like a one on one thing. Um, chat the sh- chat some shit, but also talk about some threats. So anyway, Per Nielsen said, oh. "Vic, did you just bash headless guitars and gay people in the same comment? Isn't there enough intolerance and prejudice as it is in the world already? Not cool, man. Not cool." Twenty one leaks. Yep. And then Vic responded with, "Per, I don't like either. Live with it." That's not a joke. Yeah, that's just an ignorant comment. That's it's doubling down. It's making your position clear. Yes, I was telling a joke. This is the kind of joke that people that hate gay people would laugh at. Yes. It's definitely a joke. But you can't just say, because it's a joke, it's cool. Oh, cool. Tell your joke. But don't expect me after the fact to not turn around and say... I'm not saying you're not allowed to tell that joke. Nope. But don't expect to be able to tell a joke like that and then me not be able to go... I can pretty confidently confu- con- conclude that you're homophobic. Yes. It, yeah. it, it's the same old conversation of freedom of speech is not don't freedom of consequence. Oh, God, don't say it. Why? <laughs> because freedom of speech does mean freedom from consequences from the government. 
If I'm the government. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that you are free to say anything you want and no one can call you out on it. Well, yeah, people are allowed to have opinions on what you say. That's exactly. that's exactly the freedom of speech does not mean freedom from counter speech. Oh, if you were caught counter speech, that's fine. That's, I, I, I mean, as a business, as a yeah. business person, the consequence for him is oh, that yeah. a lot of people went <laughs> stick your business up your arse. Yeah. When when that argument is made, like the freedom of speech shouldn't mean freedom from consequences, the slippery slope there is you said something that was racist, therefore you should expect to get punched in the face. And it's like, well, no, freedom of speech should make you free from that consequence. But the, the consequence that it shouldn't make you free of is other people exerting their freedom of speech to tell you why you're an idiot, why you're wrong. And yeah, as we're doing now, like I'm Correct. not, I don't want to call any violence toward Vic. I don't think we need to. I think we can just draw attention to what he said um, and point out how. I think if he had kept his mouth and fingers shut, if that's the right way to put it, no one would be talking about it again. Yep. People had just kind of moved on. Um, there's a comment there. There's a comment there. Oh no, where's the Nolly comment? I don't think he sent the Nolly comment. You look it up, and I'll read this to now. Yeah. Um. So this was. Vic's comment, correct? Uh, yeah. Is there any chance you could bring that back up so I could read it? Sure. Sorry, brother. So, I, I'm guessing this is a, a complete quote, a quote from Vic. There's a big difference between don't like and hate. I don't hate gay people pretty much as I don't hate anything. Hatred is a sick feeling and never led to anything good. Fuck whatever you like, whatever you like, it's none of my business. But don't expect me to like or sympathise your choice just because you are different. I may be tolerant to you, and that's it. What? Yeah. Like, like, first of all, who cares what your opinion is? It has absolutely no bearing on your life. And it's embarrassing that people think they are entitled enough to share their comments and opinions on things, positive or negative, on other people's lifestyle choices that have zero consequence or effect or influence on your life as if you are some sort of contributing factor. It is fucking embarrassing. Why would you think that is a good thing? Like, it, I just, it's almost like, and this sounds really stupid, right? I'm all for, like, giving voices to allies and making sure people know that they're validated and that there is support for things. But see, when you get, like, on the news, for example, here's a news story and you've got, oh, here's Jane on the street. I support this. Here's David in the street. I don't. Who gives a fuck? Who cares about these people? <laughs> Are they involved? No. <laughs> no. But let's be honest, right? Like, I don't know anybody that goes, oh, I, I've never met anybody, sorry, that's, that's went, oh no, I think I might be gay. How do I tell my parents and Vic? <laughs> really? The funniest part about this is, before we started talking about this, you were like, and there's something else we're going to talk about that you'll get really angry about. Aye. Anyway. <laughs> but, I'm just sitting here watching you get those cheeks get redder and oh, redder. Man. <laughs> Building up the K-Mac energy. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I just don't, I, I don't understand that. Yeah. Or, um, like, it's like an, uh, I, I don't even know the way to put it. Like, it's like an unchallenged privilege where yeah. people think they have this allowance to just weigh in their opinion. Like, they are relevant. You're not. Grow yeah. up. Yeah. I, I, I feel it also kind of goes both ways though like when you when you talk about like allies and showing support of, of groups and things ultimately what we want is for to live in a world where gay people feel comfortable coming out to the people that matter to them yeah like, and not they don't need to justify it to anyone else it doesn't matter if like the amen. entire world hates gay people if everyone in your family is a supporter of the gay community cool tell them absolutely amen I, I, I didn't mean that as in like I think people with a negative opinion shouldn't be allowed to talk and people who are positive should get that platform I don't mean it like that. Yeah. Uh, more so, I think it's like, if you're not involved directly with that person in their, in their affairs, who the fuck cares what you've got to say? You know what's going to happen again, is, is though, from, from this conversation, don't you? I'm going to get called a fucking social justice warrior in I the hope comments so. again. <laughs> I fucking, we're we're going to have to like hashtag it like yeah. meninist or something to see what happens. Yeah, yeah, that's not, that's not a bad idea. Um, but I'm I'm not in that camp. Like, it, Hashtag Ben Shapiro. There's, there's support. I want to support Vic in the sense that I support his right to to hold his opinions. Yes, I'll hold those opinions, and I'm glad that he shared them because I know that I'm not accidentally going to buy one of his guitars now. You know? Yes. Um, a further comment: I can't find Nolly's comment, um, but it, you know, much the same as Penn Olsen's comment. And like I say, he did have a signature guitar, and that immediately got dropped. Um, Misha Mansour also had uh, a guitar on order with him, and that got cancelled. So um, yeah. Anyway, someone else dropped a comment on Vic's wall and said, "Do I get a discount if I'm heterosexual?" And Vic guitars. Not personal page, I'd point out. 
business, business page, page responded with no, but you'd get charged twice the price if you were not. Again, not a joke. Yeah, that well, could be... As a joke, but isn't funny. That could be steering into the skid. Like, cool, there's lots of drama. I'm, I'm going to make some jokes back. Like, people are going to give me shit. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tease back. But, yeah. But it's not teasing to say that I hate gay people. Yeah, like, I don't pretty think... Much to paraphrase. I don't think it matters how many years pass. Um, and that's really what we're talking about here. If this was an, a relevant news story, if it was current, then talking about shit like this would be would would make sense. It, it, it's it's relevant, but it's not. All this was buried. Everyone had forgot about the monstrous things that he'd said. Why bring it up? What an idiot! Why bring it up? Let it die, Vic. Because the 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 thing I'll say is, if you have controversial opinions, it can isolate you from society. Mm-hmm. If you have a a, a minority opinion. <coughs> I hold some not I'm not questionable opinions, but I have questionable friends, right? Okay, uh, yep. And you have strong opinions and beliefs based yes. on them. Here's the key thing: some people won't like me for that, and it, I don't care if most people don't like me for it. What really matters is that the people that share opinions like you more for the fact that you're willing to share those opinions. Mm-hmm. Now. I should be really careful here because it, it kind of sounds like I'm like a closet KKK fan or yeah, something like I've that. Say, like, just just for clarification, he's not been like a major discriminant. <laughs> it's not like he's saying like we have an in group of people who have a specific target. Yeah. No, I'm I'm like I'm very anti religion. I'm very pro freedom of speech. Um, but I'm, you're kind of like me. It's like if you don't fuck with my shit, I won't fuck with yours. Bingo. You do it the fuck you want, yeah. and I'm out the way. Yeah. I am 100 percent supportive of people's rights to lead their lives however they choose to. Um, yeah. so, so long as that doesn't interfere with how you love yours other people's lives bingo Amen. said it many times but many people would consider that fringe view um, and in the society we live in today with the Overton window constantly shifting many people would probably call me far right or even alt right um, when I'm definitely that's all right. people center, are allowed to stretch just leaning slightly left slightly left I don't think I could ever tell you where I fall on a political uh, spectrum at all because I just want to go on my life. Yeah, you should do the political spectrum thing. It's um, yeah. Let's do it right now. You'll find out. It takes like no, let's not. I was only getting, minutes. Let's definitely not. <laughs> the last um, thing I need somebody to try to fucking smear me. Yeah, but it was like when I had my my falling out with Rob Chapman, like, mm-hmm. and he's threatening to sue me because I don't like him, and I said I don't. I I, I called him a piece of shit. Or I, yeah, I pointed out him doing something shitty and was like. You're a piece of shit. Okay, I, um, I didn't know anything about this, so it's fresh oh, to me Okay, too. cool. Yeah. So Live this is, reaction video. Yeah, this is my first experience of like dealing with a potential lawsuit. Mm-hmm. And he messaged me and everyone that commented on my post with a, a threat of legal action if I didn't take the post down and issue a public apology. <laughs> um, and also said, I've not named you yet. Like, I've not named you to all my fans yet. And to me, that was like... Well, it's a, it's, that is a threat. It's, it's, it's both ways, isn't it? It's like, hang on a minute, I need to do what you tell me or... Or you're going to sue me and threaten me. Like, there's consequences. But, but anyway, point I'm getting at is, in my response to Rob, I was like, look, Rob, I don't like you. I think you do shady shit. I, don't, I, I just don't like the way you the way you treat your fans. I think you treat everyone like they're stupid. Um, but that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that I don't like you. You don't like me. I don't like you. There's a list of people as long as my arm that I don't like. I can't go out of my way in life trying to make all of these people like me and have them try and make me like them. I'd rather just put the energy into the people that do like me. And you know what? If you outed me now, outed me as not liking you to all of your fans, cool. What that might mean is none of your fans will ever like me. But they're not my fans anyway. It doesn't matter. If if anything, if you did that, it would be good for me because the <laughs> other people that don't like you would go, oh, cool, this guy's all right. And more importantly, why are you focused on one person who doesn't like you? Yeah. Yeah, it's just... Have you nothing better to do, Rob? <laughs> are, you, are you frightened of the idea that not everyone loves you? Yeah, well, I mean, to be fair, when you when you get out into the social sphere like that and, and social media and you're on a platform and you have a small following, like, when I was younger, when <laughs> it took me a while to learn that I used to get a lot of hate comments and a lot, mm-hmm. of, a lot of shitty... Um, my videos got thumbed down, thumbs down to hell oh, for a good few uh, a good few years, where my videos would probably get seventy five percent down votes. I play party can and I understand negative comments. <laughs> um, and I had to come to that realization that uh, negativity towards you only really comes about when you're making waves. Like, cool, someone's gone to the effort of not liking me. Yeah, awesome. That's so much better than them not knowing me. Anyway. Let's move on from that because Vic, I don't want to talk about you anymore. Yeah, you you were six years ago's news. Yeah, yeah. Goodbye. Why bring it back up, you yep. fool? Um, you're, you're as relevant as the views you hold. 
Goodbye. Yeah. Uh, Pledge Music, majority shareholder charged with £25 million penny stock fraud. We have been talking about Pledge Music a few times recently because they have been struggling to pay the artists the money that they have collected on their behalf. Something is clearly going wrong with the way yep. their finances are being dealt with. Yep. This technically isn't related to Pledge Music, but you have to look at this and go, ah, person involved with dealing with the finances of this company is being investigated and sued for fucking with finances with other company. Yeah. So this is going to be a disaster if this if this comes out the way it's looking like potentially come out. That it's going to. Oh, Fire just... Festival 2. Yeah. Well, it's happening like uh, with Patreon as well. Like the, we talked about this last last time with Jack Jack Dorsey, the uh, the owner of Patreon, who is not. Oh, that's right. You were saying the platform just wasn't performing the way it should be. Jack or... Conti. Jack Conti. Jack, Jack Dorsey Conti. is Twitter. Jack Conti. Is... You've done this last time as well. Yeah. yeah. So Jack Conti um, uh, talked about this this idea that um, Patreon is an unsustainable business model the way the way it is currently. Um, last month, Who's payments to, to content creators were late. They were about four days late. Um, we got an update email this month saying that payments are going to be late again this month, but only by a couple of days. It's because we've changed this, this, and this, and like payment regulation stuff. But you have to look at it um, with an eye of like a skeptic's eye and go, is this is this all fucking up? Is this going heads up because greedy people wanted more than their 5%? I? <laughs> so we'll see if, what happens. If they are transparent with their finances, then we won't have any problems. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, it's, it's that capitalist greed thing, isn't it? Like, they're a company, <coughs> they seek to make money, their shareholders want return on their investment. Yep. And if they're, if the profits for the company are minimal, then they need to work out ways of um, improving their, their profits. So I really hope, but that's just the idiot in me, I am a constant pessimist. Everybody I know hates how pessimistic I am about everything. But in this case, I can't afford to be pessimistic or I, I will a, cry. <laughs> I think you are critically sceptic rather yeah. than pessimist. Yeah. I think you pull things to bits and you work out like, in a consequential way what's the likely the outcome here. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, but I, I'm, uh, I'm, 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 I'm lots of hesitating here because I'm sitting and thinking about this. I'm like, am I taking this position because I believe... Or because I want to believe at this stage. I'm pulling it apart. Do, 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 the do, do, writing's do, do, on the wall. <laughs> Sorry, I just said I want to believe. All right, Bumblefoot. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we'll see what happens with that. But this could be terrifying for, for modern music because crowdfunding is, is just a very... We've spoke about the throws and the dangers of it already. Like in how, we're, how we both have our own reservations. Yeah. Um, okay, let's talk Jason Becker. So, my wife told me about this, actually. Was it? She doesn't know who Jason Becker is. So, yeah. So, Connor, our pal Connor, mutual, mm-hmm. mutual pal Connor. Hi, hey, Connor. Hi, Connor. Um, he... Are you, are you for real? Uh, is uh, that Teddy saying hi to Connor as well? Yeah. Um, he was posted on Jason Becker's wall, just saying, you know, thoughts and prayers, hope you, hope you get better. Um, and Haley was like, do you know Jason Becker? What's happening with Jason Becker? Everyone's posting on his wall that he's ill. And obviously that makes me panic because I know who Jason Becker is. That makes anyone who knows who Jason Becker is panic. Yeah. And I couldn't find any actual info. I could just see lots of posts on the wall. Mm-hmm. Um, I asked Connor and he sent me a link. So this is uh, from Pat, Pat Becker, um, Jason's dad. Uh, for everyone who loves and is concerned for Jason, thank you very much for your good thoughts, prayers, meditations, and well wishes. Jason has been dealing with first a collapsed lung and then an abscess in his lung, for which he's been taking antibiotics for several months. The antibiotics bring on side effects like nausea, being short of breath, which brings on panic attacks, increased heart rate and hearing loss, which comes and goes. Not easy, especially for someone with ALS. Quite scary. He's hanging in there and appreciates your love. While we're all grateful for your love and concern. Bless you all, Pat Becker. So, it's a shame. Sad. Well, wishes and prayers from us. It uh, just really hope that you get better soon. Uh, but it just speechless. I just don't know what to say. It's an it's, it's an inevitability. Mm-hmm. Just like when we were talking about Ozzy on the last episode, like one day Ozzy Osbourne won't be here anymore, and I will be devastated. And it's exactly the same with Jason Becker. And I think it's very appropriate to commend Jason on his strength 
I mean, he was pretty oh, yeah. much when he was diagnosed with ALS, he was gave what like three years to yeah. live, yeah, which yeah. was what twenty nine or something, twenty or twenty thirty years ago. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, that's a strong man. Not only that, for him and his dad, Pat, who obviously put that post up, to then devise a language that Jason could then use, just using his eyes, and then create the device that allowed Jason to write music like that. Pff, I don't think I could have been that strong to go through any of that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I think that that says more about Jason than anyone else could. Yeah. Um, so I just want to pedal back a second mm-hmm. because uh, you're talking about Jason like everybody knows who Jason is. But Sorry. Anyone that is unfamiliar with Jason Becker, uh, Jason Becker, one of the great shred guitar players of the late 80s, um, well known for joining the band Cacophony on... Um, on Shit, what was that label called? Shrapnel. There we go. Shrapnel, That's yep. embarrassing. Uh, going for guitar lessons with Marty Friedman, and within two lessons, Marty going, hey, you're better than me. <laughs> um, yeah, so for anyone unfamiliar with those two Cacophony records, you should absolutely check them out. It's, Speed uh, Metal Symphony and Go Off. And Go Off, exactly. Fucking beautiful albums. Yeah, um, and Jason and Marty kind of complement each other's playing really well. Mm-hmm. Um, Cacophony would eventually split up, and I'm not sure if they split up and then things happened or if they split up because things were happening. And Marty obviously mm-hmm. went off and joined Megadeth. Mm-hmm. Um, and Jason Becker would find himself as the replacement for Steve Vai in uh, David Lee Roth's band. Yep. Which is a hell of a gig. A hell oh, of a man. gig. And if anyone's heard it or not heard any of the stuff he did with David Lee Roth, it's... Yeah. What's the name of the album again? A Little Ain't Enough. A Little Ain't Enough, that's yeah. the one. And it's, it's just the one album that he did with David Lee yep. Roth. Um, and again, we, we must conte- contextualise that. When David Lee Roth left Van Halen, the question of who is his guitar player going to be was the biggest question. It was going to have to be big. When shred guitar was like the main focal point of any instrumentation in music. Yeah, and Eddie, one of the icons of, of guitar at the time. So mm-hmm. whoever Dave was going to work with, was it was going to have to be a big deal. And Statement it was, in the shoes of Steve Vai. Yeah, so getting Steve in the band was a sink or swim moment. How is this going to go for David? And as far as I'm concerned, the next album after Van Halen's 1984 is David Lee Roth's Eatham and Smile. I'm not interested in the, the Sammy Hagar album. Like I'm interested in, in Dave singing. And it only works as well as it does because... Cocaine and butler's chaps. Yeah, is well, yeah, that cool. It's not. It's nothing to do with Steve. No, it's not. <laughs> to be fair, yeah, like Dave carries the album because he's Dave. He's David Lee Roth. But just the whole attitude of it, you couldn't have pulled that off if you got, say, I don't know, Gary Moore. Gary no. Moore, great guitar player, of course, great guitar player, flashy guitar player, and could would have got by. But you need high level pyrotechnic stuff to get by in that. So for Steve to have taken that gig and for it to have gone as well as it did, mm-hmm. they did the. Uh, uh, Human Smile and then Skyscraper. Uh, I think that was just those two. Yeah. You will know better than I will. Yeah. And then Jason Becker. A little ain't enough. Um, and yeah. That, this is much as I can say. Yeah. So it was during that period of recording that album that he started to notice cramps in his hands and he was having just problems, problems with his hands. Um, he went to the doctors and got diagnosed with early stage ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, uh, which is degenerative. Um, a, de- a degenerative condition that essentially w- will kill you. At, at some point, it will kill you, and usually all your muscles waste away to the point of atrophy and yeah. just not existing. Yeah. So ALS, obviously, Lou Gehrig's disease, um, probably still relevant in people's mind because of the ice bucket challenge a couple of years ago, yes. which coincidentally was what me and Rob fell out over when he, yeah, I think, yeah. Research it, people. You'll find all the information that you want. I'm going to get the story first hand later yeah, on. Yeah. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Ice Bucket <laughs> Challenge. Um, ALS, terrible condition. Um, and like, as Mike pointed out, Jason was given just a few years. Um, and he's still going, like, 30 years on. And still um, writing some of the best music you've ever heard. He managed to finish the David Lee Roth album. Uh, as far as I'm aware, he didn't do any gigs. He may have done a gig or two. I don't but think he, he ever took a life. He wasn't touring. Play. I don't with, think so. With David Lee Roth. Um, which is there is, not a great VH1 behind the music on Becker? There is. There's at least a really, really good documentary. It's about 25 minutes long, and I think it's on YouTube. It is, and it comes from. It's over there somewhere. I've got it on. Got it on DVD. Mm-hmm. So yeah, growing up, Jason Becker was like one of my big heroes. Um, I was really, 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 really into Cacophony. It was well, like Jason and Paul Gilbert. Those are like my my big influences. Guys that have got the technical, unbelievable skill, and also like this kind of slickness to them 
But you know what? The sad part is I missed all of that slickness when I was a kid. I focused on the, the technical stuff that he was doing. Jason's approach to arpeggios is just is is godly you know and when you look at like amazing metal sweep guys now like jeff loomis like he's he's a becker guy you listen to him there's a video he fucking uh, loomis for only a couple of years ago doing perpetual burn yeah yeah it's fucking fantastic to be fair to him and you can see exactly where he's got all those licks from yeah yeah so um just uh an incredibly influential player for me and now years on I have gone back to a little ain't enough because I've had to transcribe bits and pieces for people. You lost so bastard. Yeah, so I would recommend people check out songs like It's Showtime um, or Drop in the Bucket. Um, Drop in the Bucket is the one with the ridiculous solo, isn't it? I'd say It's Showtime has probably the showpiece solo. Drop in the Bucket's definitely a lot bluesier. And that's the point. Like, I missed mm-hmm. all of this when I was younger. I couldn't... I, it didn't mean anything to me. You the, want the, the licks, fan, not the flair. Exactly, yeah. And how it fit. Yeah. That is the context, isn't it, really? Yeah. Uh, we, you're, you're too busy looking at, like... The flower and not the field. I'll be completely honest, right? So when I first heard A Little Ain't Enough, I didn't like it. And because it was purely because I bought the album because I was a huge Jason Becker fan. And I was like, right, let's see what he's he's done. And there's It's Showtime. That's like the, there's a big solo on that. But for the most part, there's no really, it's not Cacophony. It's not his solo album, Perpetual Burn, <sighs> you know? Yeah. So to a, a 15 year old Levi, however old I was when I got that, it didn't have what I was expecting. And therefore, Did you hate Go Off for the same reason? Because there's vocals on it. There's vocals on on the first on on the Speed Metal Symphony. Is there? Yeah, yeah. I don't remember that. No, I mean, no probably Nin- Desert Ninja, Island. Ninja, Ninja. Is on. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Aye, sorry, I'm talking shit. Uh, for some reason, <laughs> I had in my head that one was just purely yeah. instrumental and one. No, was there's, there's only the vocals. two instrumental tracks on. I love Desert Island. Also. It's a yeah. great track. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I'm going off. Savage. It opens with Savage. Oh. Right? Yeah. Um, anyway, yeah. So. Um, End of night. So yeah, real shame, but. Really, also really inspiring the fact that Jason has has kept going for as long as he has. Uh, Absolutely, continued writing music, and as Mike pointed out, there is a documentary that you can watch on YouTube uh, that will, that will show you the struggles he goes through. The man is confined to a wheelchair; he cannot move his limbs. Um, he can move his eyes. He and he his is, chin and one finger, I think it is. Um, I want to say that he can't even move his chin or his eyes. No, I'm sure that's how he uses the device, is it not? For writing the music. I'm sure he can twist his chin and use his finger. Uh, I'm certain he's got like very, very limited movement. I may be completely wrong. Uh, But yeah, point is, for all intents and purposes, confined to wheelchair. Let's let's think Stephen Hawking, but without the uh, without the computer to talk for him. Yes. But yeah, his dad has trooped on and and looked after him for a very long time. And uh, yeah, as Mike pointed out, come up with a way that Jason could communicate using his eyes. Uh, And then they developed a way that he could interface with a computer. And then he composed. He composed for a long time. uh, Released the album Perspective back in the late 90s, maybe? Early 2000s? I don't know, 2096, 96, okay. And then... Um, which has got Michael Lee Furkins on guitar. Which exactly. is another musician that you need to check out. Yeah. Another gift that Jason has brought to the world is having someone like that, who within his own right is a complete guitar hero. Yeah. But putting him in another platform. Yeah. Uh, but also releasing... He released an album just this year, right? That's right. That's a Valley of Fire. Is that the name of the album or is that the song? Triumphant Hearts. Triumphant yeah. So, Yeah amazing that he's still going so we really do hope that that jason manages to pull through and i'm not going to say that if he doesn't it's not the end of the world but what we can say is if the worst comes to the worst i'm really it's it's amazing that he's left the legacy that he has when most people would have stopped yep at the moment they got there as i say it's it's more than a testament to the strength of the man that he's still here Mm. so yeah sad one that but mm. why don't we perk things up with some devon townsend yeah. You do this one. So, I really love Devin Townsend. Like, I really love Devin Townsend. I think he is, for the last couple of years, he's been a bit meandering in terms of maybe pandering too much to fit in internet meme culture, in my opinion. But I still always really like his music. And as a person, I think he's, he's much deeper than he lets on. But then there's all these little stories that come out that show that he's also quite mental. Like, yeah, loves to just do weird, impulsive shit. So, on Ultimate Guitar, there was a, a recent story that the headline was, Devin Townsend, that time I took a dump in Steve Vai's guitar case and shoved Jay Leno's phone up my ass. Now, when I saw that headline, Levi had posted it in our group, and I had seen it just before then, I was like, 
Oh, Devin. I, I, I was like, that's clickbait. I mean, <laughs> Devin's mental, but really? Is he, is he going to go, are these things that actually happened or is he just being silly? Well, this is a man that wore a scallop for many years and thought that, he that did was... I. His YouTube name is Poopy Nuggeteer. Is it? And it has been for years and years and years. It might have a different one now, but I remember like, watching silly animations of him like making silly faces and songs out of fart noises and whatever else. Anyway, Devin's talking about being 19 and part of Steve Vai's first solo band and being the only person that sung on one of the albums. And uh, this came from the uh, Talk is Jericho uh, podcast, I believe, um, transcribed by Ultimate Guitar. Steve Vai had, I think he would admit that as well, certain aspects of controlling that ended up backfiring on him. And there were certain aspects of my inability to articulate my discontent that resulted in me taking a dump in his guitar case. I had a hard time articulating myself, so you got to go, I was like, ah, you, ah. Which is just madness. So, the story goes, we did the Tonight Show. Or sorry, this is one of the other stories. We did the Tonight Show. Management at this time was a really famous dude who did not get me. So we did the Tonight Show. This is Devin talking, by the way. And the day before, we put me in this thing where I'm supposed to rehearse all these moves, the whole lead singer shit. They had me looking at pictures of Axl Rose and I'm going, I hate this. Which you can imagine Devin being like, nah. At the time, he's bald. And in the video for In My Dreams With You, it's all backwards and he's like being really creepy intentionally. Um... Anyway, he goes on. They spent a bunch of money to give me these big fake dreadlocks and whatever was hip at the time. So the day before the Tonight Show, me and my buddy Mark, who's still one of my best friends, we shaved all of my hair. I shaved my eyebrows, I went to Walmart and got a pair of grey shorts and wrote my buddy's names all over myself, arms and everything. <coughs> Madness. Explaining how he got to the backstage with the band and his buddy Mark, Devin added, we were like, these guys suck this sucks, and Steve's in a shitty mood, and Jay Leno's like, funny voice, how you doing kid? So Mark's like, we should fuck with them. <laughs> so we went into the back room, there's an office there, a green room, a phone and all this stuff. So we locked the door, I took off all my clothes, and started doing all these poses, and Mark's like, you should stick that phone up your ass. So I did, and we took a photo, and it's online. If you look up online, Devin Townsend, phone and ass, it's a picture of me in the back room of the Tonight Show, with a phone up my ass. Well, we, 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 thought we have funny. to do that when we're told, don't we? Well, the top comment, if you scroll down on this, the very top comment is a photo of Devin with a phone up his ass. Wow, okay. That's, like, um... the, yeah, you didn't expect that, but it's happening. That is literally Devin with a phone up his ass. And just, just to prove that the whole madness of Devin, see if you scroll down, I'm oh, sorry, I'm clicking things. If you scroll down on that, for that that's a great gif you've got Steve I also try to be serious and Devin being a fucking nut job I love that he just he was like I'm not bothered about this really serious shit I'm just gonna fuck about it's it's a ballsy move when you consider that like it's not Devin's band no you're in the, the Steve only time Vai that, band the only time that Steve I really had a vocalist yeah. a, a, actually at all had yeah, a yeah, vocalist yeah, yeah. yeah so it's the Steve Vai band and you're just Clowning around like an absolute fucking idiot. What a yeah, it's bozy. That's that's what I'd so put it as. Sorry, I think where were we? What I take from it story wise is that you should not let Devin get bored or piss him off in your company. Yes, and the other story was about shitting in Steve Vai's guitar case. Is that there? It that's it basically just says that Steve Vai was controlling and I get annoyed, so I shit in his case. That, that that's again, yeah. all right. Being being a dick uh, on the on the Leonard show in Steve's band and not giving a fuck what Steve thinks that's one thing shitting in your boss's guitar case shitting in Steve Vai's guitar uh, case I wonder what their relationships like now probably not great saying that though yeah I when think... I went to the retinal circus Steve Vai does all the narration yeah they talk fondly about each other so I think it's probably the the kind of thing that at the time they're raging about but the fact that they parted ways. Um, time heals all wounds and all that. Like, you know what? I probably think look it, back on those memories quite fondly. I think even better than that, I think Steve's just like, what an artist. He expressed <laughs> himself in such a way. Yeah. <laughs> like, I can't believe it. Yeah. Um, there's a wee bit more left in that article when he's talking. So he says, uh, so we left thinking nothing of it. We went to Jay Leno's desk, taking pictures, mooning. Anyway, next morning, phone rings. Management was like, what in the fuck were you doing? And I was like, we played the show? What? And he's like, no, I can't believe you did that. Did you stick the phone up your ass? Why would you do that? And Devin's like, no, I didn't. But they had it on camera. 
<laughs> they've got all these images of you with a phone up your ass and now we can't come back so we went on tour after that Steve by this point was thoroughly confused with my guitar pick saying don't use Jay's phone so he must have had custom picks made that said don't use Jay's phone and people have got them probably not knowing that story oh amazing absolutely amazing. it makes me think what other mad things have happened on tour with Devin Townsend that haven't came out this is doubly funny because after that it says, although Google Images displays no images of Devi with the phone. Um, yeah, there's one below in the comments. So <laughs> they didn't look very hard, did they? No. I've uh, done my wrong. It might have been taken off with good reason. Yeah. Um, cool. So I think just two more things to talk about. Uh, one would be Mr. Richard Benson, but there's something else. Um, my new gadget. Yes. And very you exactly. love your gadgets, especially on your Danny Gadget Telecaster. Good point, yeah. Forgive me, Danny. Yeah. So, obviously, people listening to the podcast won't be able to see this, but uh, I was sent... It's Axe Mount Cam, is that what it says on that end? Axe Cam Mount. Axe Cam Mount. Um, yeah, company Axe Cam Mount, make the Axe Cam Mount, and it's uh, very much like Troy Grady's Magnet. A little bit more complicated than Troy's Magnet, to be to be fair. Um, 3D printed it camera mount. solid. Yeah. Um, I've, I still need to play around with it, uh, I'll do a review on it. I'll let people know what I think. Um, it was really, I think, a case of me giving them feedback on the product and, mm -hmm. and looking to improve it, uh, if possible. Like, uh, there are some things that I, I think I'd adapt a little bit on it. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, certainly an interesting thing. You can obviously you can mount your phone this side and film your hand, but you can also mount a GoPro here yep. and film film the other side. Um, or you could mount two GoPros on it. And yeah, film, it's got space for both. Film both sides with a GoPro. Um, I can't be arsed with a GoPro anymore. <laughs> phone's just so quick and easy you know it is man and the camera quality you get on phones these days is silly yeah so um i'm looking forward to seeing what i can do with this i think it's going to be a lot of fun to do a lot of tutorial videos on like hybrid picking and finger Definitely. style stuff and you'll be able to really see the technique um yeah i think if you're a serious teacher serious teacher uh working online something like this is i'm almost going to say a must have you know if well, you, you think about it if you manage to get a cam that's live to that while you're doing skype lessons you can be talking as you're talking and have two cameras separate feeds split mm. and you could be showing your picking hand and your fretting hand yep obviously it does get in the way of wanting to play higher up on the neck but um, yeah but I don't imagine you're ever going to be like right so we're going to play a piece that goes all over the neck while I'm using this yeah I mean my improvising style is very much let's see how much of the neck I can play <laughs> oh, okay fair but enough. yeah it, it has certain uses um, but I, I, I yeah I really do I think it's quite a cool thing I think it's um like I say, a few things that um, that I would implement slightly differently. Uh, every part of it is 3D printed, which, uh, yeah, it's really cool to see some an actual first-hand example of 3D printing um, yeah. uh, and it being used quite well. Uh, my criticisms of it, and I'll be doing a full video review on this, but you see all the red parts on it? Mm -hmm. um, the, the bits that come into contact with the neck there and also there. Um, they're also 3D printed. It's, it's more like rubber, isn't it? It's a softer material, but I don't think it's soft enough. Okay. Um, I've said my suggestion to them is, you know, why have you 3D printed these red bits when you could just put rubber pads there? Um, and they're like, because we can't 3D print rubber pads. And I'm like, yeah, but you can just buy rubber pads and put them on. Um, the TC Electronic pedals, they come with uh, rubber pads that you affix to the bottom of the pedal if you want to use rubber pads. If you want to put Velcro on, cool, put your Velcro there. But literally, just something like that would would go mm. good there. I um, Because there's no way to know how tight you need it on your phone. And because this isn't as soft as I'd like it to be, I didn't want to over tighten it. I understand. So there is a video. I have a video uh, of me using this and my phone falling out while I'm. Uh, oh. Yeah. So I'd, evidently I just didn't have it tight enough. Uh, use it at all. Yeah. So you need to you'll need to clamp down. But I think that if there was rubber there, that would be less of a problem. The fact that my phone could slip out tells you that these don't provide friction grip. I think it's, it's just, just as much the concern it. that you don't want to cause damage to your phone as well. Yeah. Which is, which is understandable. Yeah. And in itself, that that is one of the problems with a product like this. You are giving it to guitar players and expecting them to strap it onto a very expensive instrument. So the same applies here with these bits. They are soft, but I can't help but think, would I be more comfortable if they were softer? Mm -hmm. um, I'll clip it on this Telecaster because it's a some Mexican Telecaster. It's like, a great guitar. I don't really care if this gets bad, but am I going to clip it on a £5,000 Mayonnaise? I remember watching you bite that guitar. Like, literally like that and leaving finish marks. Yeah, it's a finish Again. Mark. Yep. Cool. It's a telly. They're supposed to get beat up, you know? Um, so I don't mind if this one gets scratched up and bad, but would I feel 100% comfortable putting this on a £5,000 guitar? 
Not yet. Not quite yet. Yeah. And it's the same. Oh, that's cool. With, same with clipping your phone on there. You know, you. I imagine if your phone slips out of this and breaks, the company aren't going to be liable for it. They're not okay. going to accept liability for it. So, yeah, you you do run that problem. But I, I do think it's a, a cool piece of kit, and I'm looking forward to seeing what I can do with it. So, yeah, that is the AxCam mount. Um, not paid product placement or anything like that. They haven't paid me to talk about this. Um, yeah. So, or me, because I don't have one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, not that they have any use for it. They'll be like, oh, you just make a lot of noise and mess. Yes. That's my playing style. But no, I think it's really cool. I watched the video that I kind of snip it, you put up all of it. Yeah. And the first thing I thought when I saw it was like, that's cool. And it's obviously 3D printed. It looks like it's been done really well. It's a good quality bit of kit for what it is. Yes. But like any product, refinement's a great thing. Here's the question. Mm-hmm. How much? No idea. Yes. Because this is what it all comes down to, isn't it? With a product like this, if it's $1,000, it's too much. If it's $5, awesome. There's a line, isn't there, with how much something like that is worth. I don't think I'm the right person to make that judgment because I don't have any real knowledgeable practical use for it. But let's just guess 60 quid. Okay, you're a bit low. Okay. And therein is the other problem of the product. It's 200 bucks, right. which is, what, 160. So it's not cheap. For the right audience, for the yeah, and there's a niche product. Yeah, it's, I mean, if if that's what they're targeting, then brilliant. Well, the hope is that if it becomes more popular, there will be improvements to manufacturing processes that bring the cost down. Yeah, yeah in different versions, etc. Totally yeah. get that. That's yeah. fair enough. That's fair so enough. I, I, those are my criticisms of the product, but like I say, I'll do this on a on a video review. Here's a question: What's the price of the competitor? Well, that is the best question of all because there is no competitor. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. There you was have, you, have a, you have your own part of the market. Troy Grady was planning to manufacture it. He kickstarted it. But again, this tells you why maybe that's too expensive. When Troy Grady kickstarted the magnet, uh-huh. it didn't reach its goal. So that wow. shows you how much demand there is for it. Especially for something that's quite popular. At the I, time, he wasn't as popular as he is now. I think if he kickstarted it now, he would have been okay. Okay. But here's the thing. When Troy Grady kickstarted his, you could buy it for 45 bucks. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. It's definitely an interesting one. I'll be, um, yeah, like I say, keep my eyes on it. I'll be seeing what I can do with it. And um, yeah, who knows? Maybe I'm going to fall in love with the damn thing and be like, this is worth 200 bucks all day long. Sweet as enough. Yeah. But as I currently look at it, I, the thing is, I don't know how much 3D printing costs. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if that's a reasonable, I in my mind, 3D printing is cheap. But maybe. That's, that's how it's definitely marketed. Yeah. Always. I was going to buy a 3D printer for Haley's dad for his 60th because I think he'd love playing around with something like that. I think Tom would lose his shit if you go on that. Yeah, exactly. Um, Tom, if you're listening, close your ears. Yeah, no, he's... Well, no. <laughs> nah. No, no, no. Never. Um, yeah. He gets enough of your shit. Yeah. <laughs> so I have no idea if, like... I guess what it really comes down to, and then we're talking outside of guitar stuff, is what's your profit margin? Is your profit margin on this unreasonable? Is it $200 because that's what you need to charge in order to make a small profit? Or is it $200 because you want too much profit? Yeah. I, in my mind, because I have no idea how much something like this costs to make, I think it's too expensive. I think that there's too much profit on it. But I'm talking, I'm, that's t- totally talking out of my ass. Yeah. If, if the company that made this turned around to me and said, you know what, it actually costs us $180 to make, then I'd go, you know what, fair enough, good price. Yeah. Yeah. Your price. So I don't really know what I'm talking about. Anyway, <laughs> lastly, let's talk about. Um, Have you ever said that before, Levi? Well, I don't know what I'm talking about. Ever? Yeah. I don't think he's ever admitted that. I don't believe him. <laughs> I don't believe him. Okay. I do know what I'm talking about. Um, oh, I've got one thing. One I'll thing. Go for it. One thing. One, one, one thing. You remember when you said to me, Levi. <laughs> ah, you're about, the second person to do this. Go on, Em. You, rem- you remember when you said to me, and we, <laughs> we, were, we were talking about. Uh, Drive home. Yeah, yeah, Guthrie Govan. Yep. 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 And you were adamant not. That's an Ebo. Yep. yep. Definitely an Ebo. Yep. Your boy Petey. Yep. On Instagram sent me a little link going, yep. oh, by the way, nope. Steve Wilson put a post up saying that it was this uh, La Rose guitar, a custom that Guthrie Govan played on it. Fed it with a Sustainiac pickup. Yeah, I was wrong. But uh, you know, Sorry, what? I had to bring up. That's a really good learning experience for me because I've not had the, I've not been able to, I've not had the chance to play with one of those. Yeah. Um, I wanted one fitted in my fretless. Yep. Because I thought that, that would be yeah really cool. Um, I I'm not sure. 
you know the the engineering of how they work mm -hmm. um but i had assumed that it can't be the, the exact same way that an ebo works pretty certain it is but rather than it being focused on one string or two strings where you hold it above it's all six and you do the muting manually okay for what i've played of them that's how it feels and you have a switch for like just basically sustain the note and like a harmonic right i think the same as the ebo okay where you can yeah, yeah. am i right in thinking yeah. that yeah that's how the ebo works you've got two settings for it yeah regular so and harmonic kind of same idea cool from what I, the only one i've played before was the uh when i played a revel elite mm -hmm. the dave kushner one with sustain okay yeah um yeah so I, I absolutely need to try one of those out then because I, I love the ebo, ebo i think the ebo is great it's a lot of fun and it has a very unique sound yeah. so if the sustainiac can sound that much like an ebo then cool yeah i'm sold so yep yeah, there we go i was wrong on something sometimes i don't know what i'm talking about and sometimes i'm wrong it happens it's real and the well the most important thing is like when you're wrong about something just hold your hands up and be like cool learning experience it happens to me all the time <laughs> Um, cool, so let's talk about Inani, Inani, Inani. Actually, before we do that... Gnome, gnome, yeah. gnome. I had a student today, and he, uh, an Italian student, and um, we were talking about, uh, he was talking about how bad the music scene is in Italy right now. <coughs> and then I mentioned this particular artist and went, it can't be that bad, you still got this guy. And he was like, how do you know about this person? The folklore. <laughs> yeah, and... Um, I found that with every Italian I've ever spoke to, especially guitar players, if I mention this person, they're like, how do you know of this person? <laughs> like it's some secret club. Um, but in that lesson, he also made a recommendation, an audio thing. Um, Etienne uh, Pelosov. Pelosov. I would assume that's what it said. Etienne Pelosov. Uh, true brutal black jazz, and you know it's true because it's got a V for a U. Yes, so true is spelt with a V. True brutal. <coughs> black jazz um he said check this out uh let me know what you think and i gave it a listen i listened to the entire thing earlier today and uh, it's interesting it's cool i wouldn't say you know it's not the kind of thing that you listen to and you go oh this is going to be my new favorite album but it also you know 10 20 minutes in it wasn't like i was like i need to turn this off right now oh. i was happy to see it through to the end kind of thing yeah it's as the name would suggest i mean he starts out by playing miles davis's so what but doing like a, a metal jazz version of it very much like panzer ballet do Yes. Has a lot of that vibe t to it. Don't you dare. <laughs> Levi just got a, we're going to update your computer. Don't you Fuck dare. you, Windows. Fuck you. Yeah. Um, yeah, so true, brutal, black jazz. Um, I I like anything that's, that, that tries something new. Genre bending. Yeah, and this is a, a proper genre bender. I don't think the recording's that good. Um, I don't think it's <laughs> meant to be. That that would fit in with the black metal style of it. Like, true. The, 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 there's a very particular uh, production style. Using a webcam mic for all of your vocals, yeah. Uh, using a webcam mic to record everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't think it At sounds quite time. that bad, but every now and again there are vocals on it, and I think most of the vocals kind of drag it down a little bit. But yeah, Etienne P uh, Pelosov, true black metal jazz. Honestly, give it give it a listen, guys. See what you think. Let me know. It's um, interesting. It's cool. Yeah, I have some moments on that I thought were quite cool. And anything where there's a saxophone makes me happy. So, um, yeah. Anyway, so the guitar player that we're going to talk about is Richard Benson. Richard Benson. And you mentioned it to me earlier, and I was like, no, I don't know him. Yeah. And then as soon as I saw the screenshot or like the, the snippet from the video before he even pressed play, I was like, I know who that is. Yeah. Yeah. And so, those of you who have it, have Facebook and are interested in guitars in any way, shape, or form will know who this is, even if you don't know the name. Yeah, so I've known who Richard Benson was for many years because I've had lots of Italian students. Evidently, I've got a following in Italy, which is nice because I love Italy. I think it's a beautiful country. Um, I've been a couple of times, and yeah, it's, I've, I've been to a lot of Europe, actually, and Italy's mm -hmm. my favourite my favorite place in I've never in been Europe. to Italy. Beautiful country. Of course, I've been in Malta. Okay, yeah. Which isn't Italy. Malta's Malt nice, too. Malta's beautiful. Malta's very, very warm. Mm-hmm. Um, but Italy, yeah, lo love Italy, and I've had quite a few Italian students over the years, and um, some of them mention Richard Benson to me, and when they don't, I tend to mention Richard Benson to them, and it's it's not like, oh, I don't know who that is. They talk about him like he's a household name, which I found really interesting. So um, I was chatting with an Italian just recently, um, and I had to pull out a Richard Benson video in order to you know have that sort of in-joke with an Italian friend. Um, and I went on YouTube and I found that there's a YouTube channel called Press Play. Now, they only have two and a half thousand subscribers, so a very small channel. Much smaller than my channel. Um, much, much smaller than my channel. But they uploaded a video called The Story of Richard Benson, Worst Guitar 
uh, guitarist ever. English with Italian subs. And this video is verging on a million views now. So the channel is much smaller than mine, but this one video has more, 10 times more views than my most popular video. And it's quite a cool video. Yeah. So understandable why it's got so many views, not only for uh, Richard's own fame, but yep. for the people curious about him in general. Yeah, absolutely. So I think the thing with Richard Benson, for those unfamiliar, with the, the basic story of Richard Benson is um, not particularly talented guitar player, somehow manages to get a little bit of like put some music out in in italy mm -hmm. um gets a little bit of a following for being a bit of a joke um but then turned into a full-on like a full-on joke where he would appear on tv shows and everyone he'd be there just to laugh people would laugh at him and at his concerts and performances people would turn up with food and they'd throw food at him and he doesn't seem he never seemed a well man no someone that I'm sure deep down inside, he's devastated that people are throwing food at him while he's performing. But he'll take that in lieu of being actually revered. Yeah, yeah. It, it's what I mentioned earlier, right? It's hate comments. Cool, at least you know who I am. Like, Aye. Yeah. So, uh, Is it better to have people throwing rotten eggs at you than for them to not know who you are? Infamous versus famous. Rich has gone with the yes. So... Uh, but it's really tragic to see. So he suffers from uh, from arthritis, and this is something that sort of they go into a lot more detail in the video. Because yeah. for years and years, I'd known who Richard was, and everyone would laugh at him. But but actually, oh. more of the his life and who mm. he is and the struggles that he goes through. Um, obviously, I was never exposed to that, so it's it's actually really sad to to, to see. I, I think that, that I totally agree with that because even when you were just showing me bits of this documentary earlier on, I had the same reaction. I was like, "Oh, this guy's a fucking joker. He's at it." Blah blah blah, and then there's footage of him walking on stage, and he's almost crippled. Yeah, and I'm like, what the fuck? People have turned up to throw shit at this guy. Yeah, and basically just fuck with a disabled man. Yeah, like that's dark as shit, and that yeah. kind of changed my opinion right yeah. away. Yeah, even at the point where you and I were almost like not arguing, but we were kind of voicing different opinions on what we think of Richard and his approach to this, and maybe what he's going through mentally to to, to allow that to happen yeah. to himself and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely, um, there's definitely something not right about it. Yeah. Um, it, it, aye, that, that's a good way to put it. Having like said that, having said that, this is kind of what we were arguing about, right? Having said that, I really look at it and I'm like, what? why don't people just leave him alone? Why don't people just not turn up to any of his performances and let him fade off into obscurity? But is that going to damage him more? Yeah, is Mentally. that what he wants? No. No, yeah, I think that would. If he did a performance and no one was there, I think he, I think he'd die of shame. Misery. I think it would break his heart, and he'd die there on the spot. Um, it's really, really tragic um, that he's not a well man, and as I say, uh, suffers from arthritis. Uh, I believe he he tried to commit suicide. He he jumped off a, a bridge, which um, he he survived, and that only made him worse. Uh, his guitar playing is it is atrocious. It's erratic. Yeah, it's frenetic. Yeah, it's spastic. Yeah, it's um, it, it's party cannon. No, <laughs> it's not. It's that not bad. that bad. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, I'm really... going to send you the new party cannon tabs, and I'm going to challenge you to learn some stuff. And you can film you playing it on your nice little cam. Sorry, was it axe? Axe cam, cam mount. mount. Sorry. Yeah. And you, I'm going to going to see that. That's the challenge. If anyone's interested in watching Levi try to play these riffs and put his money where his mouth is, Mike, I can't even play my own riffs. Oh, if I was jamming some Hellcat Molly the other day, I can't play that. I'm learning the new part of kind of stuff and there's bits in it where I'm just like, there are so many timing, feel and position changes that my brain is melting. Yeah. But I'm getting there. <laughs> I'm excited to hear how it's going to be when it comes out. Sorry. <coughs> I'm good. totally distracting here. No, no, it's good. Um, Richard Benson. I like laughing about part of kind of. Horrendous guitarist. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, but also a tragic, tragic story. Definitely. Um, I mean, we, when we were watching the earlier footage of him, there's bits in it where you can tell that he has a sense of melody. He's not like just completely atrocious. He's, he's choosing to be that way. Like you, you can see there's there's hints of him understanding timing yep. and uh, melody and kind of feel not to a mature level. Well, I'm going to go with, I can't remember who I used this insult for or on first, but I've used it many times over the years because I like it. I think it's really fitting. And actually, more so with Richard Benson than anyone, he sounds to me like somebody that's read a hundred books about music but has never heard any. 
That's what it sounds like to me when you mm. when he's doing that that classical piece. It sounds like he's read loads of classical theory books and he's read loads of classical compositions. Yep. Um, but he's never ever heard anything being played. He knows the rules, but none of the nuances. Yeah. That's okay. That's what it sounds like. Okay. Um, so certainly not not a, anyone that should be famous. Um, no. But yeah, like I say, it's that difficult one. That's what he wants. He wants to be on TV. He wants to. How much is he amping himself up when he's on TV? He's not in that video where he was trying to push his latest album. Like he could, he would have got a lot more views if he was screaming and shouting and ranting around. Buy my album! It's the best guitar album you'll ever hear. Are you sure about Check that? Check my legs. He did make a very questionable claim that that's the last ever recording I believe it. of David Bowie. I believe it. I believe, mate. He's he's a big deal in Italy. There is no doubt in my mind that his label will have been able to secure something from Bowie. I have voicemail. Stop phoning me. <laughs> yeah. I say I believe it. I'm not saying it's true. I should look into it. I should. I, want, I was going to buy the album to be You fair. want to believe it. It's not about believing it. You want to believe it. Scully. I need to believe it, to be honest, because if it's a lie, then he's a piece of shit. And I don't, I don't want to think ill of him. I don't think he's a piece of shit. I think he's a man with a lot of problems. If he's trying to sell an album and he's saying this is the last... Uh, ever recorded performance from David Bowie. But he doesn't use that as a selling point. He's just talking about it himself and he sees that that is on there. But that will be a selling point among I. Bowie's fans. True. But how many Bowie fans are going to look up Richard Benson? No one. But how many people are going to see, oh, my favourite singer of all time. What was the last thing he ever performed on? I must have it. Go on Google. Just, it's like just... I, I mentioned this before actually when talking to you. Um, Brent Mason. The first ever recording that Brent Mason appeared on was a Chet Atkins album. Yep. The last ever recording that Chet Atkins played on was Brent Mason's uh, first album. Mm -hmm. That's nice to me. And I know that because I'm interested in both of those players. Yep. Um, if I wasn't as interested in in, uh, in Brent, <coughs> but I was interested in Chet, I would find out where his, his last performance uh, mm -hmm. ever was. And, you know, so what you, what you wanted me to look up? I think it's, it'd be a very hard thing to verify is what I'm trying <laughs> to say. Well, David Bowie, all music, right? They buy all music. The website All Music. All right, I've never heard of this. How can I be so in touch with memes and shit and have no idea about other things that are functional and useful in the internet? Well, I use a website like um, like uh, All Music because it tracks um, it tracks performers and albums and artists and all that, and I use it for Brent Mason mainly actually mm -hmm. because it keeps track of every recording he's played on right so i can look at you know like oh this particular shania twain album is that brent mason playing guitar oh yes it is um because stuff like that is often hard to find information on um so in okay, theory if under this if i go under overview if i look under credits mm -hmm. you would expect mm, not seen it Control F. Search. Good point. And put in Richard Benson. There's Richard Russell. That's 2018. And we're going older. It's not Richard Cheese. <laughs> not showing up. No. Uh, but to be fair, maybe Richard Benson isn't on here. Let's have a look. You could have a point. But then, I'm going to have to sue allmusic.com because that's not all music <laughs> yeah good point well I mean I'm not on all music so then, then the website's incorrect yep. change that name <coughs> most music some music collection of music so one last look right okay I, I think my point was that it's going to be a very very hard thing to actually like clarify and confirm Not speaking Italian makes this hard. Very. I was walking with David Bowie, Richard Benson on Radio Rock, 2018. Yeah, it seems to all just be reference to the to the video where he announces it. Yep. Hmm. Yep. Anyway, 
what a weird place to close because we're not entirely sure. But I would encourage people to to go and check out that full documentary on, on and, Richard Benson. And on that point, if <coughs> anyone can verify that point, that it's true or not, please get in contact. That'd be very interesting. Yeah. And for those of you who haven't heard of Richard Benson or are maybe a wee bit aware of him but haven't seen it, go watch a documentary. It's ridiculous. The story of Richard Benson. Almost as good as that Firefest documentary. Nearly. <laughs> Nearly. Why do we watch so many documentaries? Documentaries are addictive, aren't they? Oh, man. Look, I think ones that are like, they say all that taboo, niche, need for negative stories, if you know what I mean. Like It's always like horrible things or morbid curiosity that gets me when it comes to documentaries. I don't watch documentaries about like nice shit. It's always about like serial killers or natural disasters or just like it's the grim shit that you want to know about that you don't really talk about in public. Yeah. Unless you've got freakish friends like yeah, us. Yeah, those old crime documentaries they are where it's at, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Saying that I've still not watched season two of Making a Murderer, so Neither have I, I probably won't. Yeah, uh, I'll intend to get around to it. Um anyway, yeah, as usual, uh, please do please do like, share, subscribe, tell your friends, tell your enemies, go on uh, Teespring and grab yourself a guitar souls t shirt. There is a link in the description. Uh, because yeah that's cool go and check out our friends at rev amplification um because those guys those guys rock they rock they rock they rock they rock and we've got a well levi has a very beautiful thing to show off soon yeah yeah that um that that was delayed in shipping not because it's not done but because when he was like shipping monday i was like cool um did you get the cab done and he was like oh i wasn't 100 percent sure if you wanted the cab and i was like oh yeah, yeah i definitely want the cab need a matching cab and he was like cool leave it with me i'll get it done and i'll let you know so nice just waiting on the cab to be done nice. uh, but very cool um anything that you want to you want to add just thanks very much again for supporting and listening um as levi said if, if you want to make your lives a wee bit easier in terms of hosting costs well levi's hosting costs feel free to grab a t-shirt we'd like to see if people supporting and wearing them um but it'd, it'd be great um as ever as levi said as well like share subscribe punish your friends by passing this on to them listen to it in the car play it in the office run your own pirate radio just giving these episodes 24 7 on the internet ask teddy i'm gonna let you do the closing thing today okay and uh as ever you mean until next time sorry until next time bye papa oh he's waving look.